All right, folks, welcome back to Uncle Narlo's Story Time. We finished up Emmy's path last time. She's the route that was over here. We would have gotten um, these piece, these four pieces right here of the, uh, the, the pictures. This time we're going to go up to Hanako's route. She will be up the kind of center left here. So we're going to try that next. So the way we're going to do this is I'm going to give you just, we're just going to have screenshots as we go. If you want to see the whole story, you can go back and watch the, the ones, just follow the common path all the way through and over in Emmy's chapter until we get to the actual uh, arc. Uh, what we'll do here is we'll just go through and, and give screenshots and show the important parts, tell you, remind you what's happening in the story until we get to a decision that changes the story and then we will take that decision and we'll play through those scenes. So that is what we're going to start now. And welcome to Katawa Shoujo Hanako's story. Our story begins at our school where it is in the afternoon, about 4 p.m. Um, we are up underneath uh, the trees in the wintertime, back behind the school, uh, waiting in the snow. We were given a note asking us to meet someone back here at 4 p.m. It was an anonymous note slipped into our uh, math book. So we're waiting, and... Uh, Along comes a girl, Iwanoko, a girl from our class, who we have been watching and noticing for some time now. She admits that she is the one that put the note in our math book, and then asks if we would like to start going out with her as our boyfriend, uh, as her boyfriend. Uh, this causes us a good deal of stress and anxiety, although it was something that we were very happy to hear and we start having a thumping in our chest and the world turns black and we fall to the ground and pass out. We are rushed to a hospital where we undergo heart surgery for a congenital heart defect and spend the next four months basically lying in a hospital bed. Um, our classmates come and visit us for a while but slowly, slowly but surely they all drift off and we lose touch with them and even Iwanako. Um, we spend the next four months sitting in the hospital bed absolutely depressed and feeling sorry for ourselves until the surgeon comes in and tells us that we are ready to be discharged. He has been talking to our parents and they've all decided that it is no longer safe for us to go back to our old school, but that we are going to go to a special school for the disabled where they have nurses on staff 24-7 and we will be able to be looked after. Needless to say, we are very disappointed and disgusted in this uh, situation, feeling that, that, that we are now one of the crippled kids. So we arrive at Yamaku and our parents go to empty the car and take our stuff to the dorms while we head toward the main building and where someone is supposed to be waiting for us. We go inside where we meet Muto, our homeroom teacher. Uh, he tells us that he will take us up to the class. He has been waiting for us. And once we reach there, he asks, Does he, do we want to introduce ourselves to the class or do we want to be introduced by him? This time around, we decide that we'll let him do the introductions. So we go up and we meet the class. We stand in front of it while he, tell, while he introduces us and talks to the class for a while. While he is talking about friendship and everyone getting along and meeting the new kid, we look around the class and notice all the various disabilities and all there, the ones that we can identify and the ones that we can't, and notice a few students in particular that are are standing out to us. One in the back with long, beautiful hair who seems to be covering most of her face. Another one who uh, stares at us intently with glasses. And a friend to her side with shockingly pink hair. It turns out that our chair is right next to theirs and they are the first two students that we are introduced to. They are Misha, the girl with the pink hair, and Shizune. Shizune is the president of the student council and is also deaf. Misha is her translator. 
Um, the two of them talk to us for a while. We work on a homework assignment, and then when the lunch bell rings, we head down to the cafeteria together. Do you want to know something, Misha says. What, I reply. About anything. Will your guide says so you should ask if there's something. Hmm, I wonder. So last time we asked, we told them we had everything we needed to know. So how about this time we ask about the library? Oh yeah, is there a library in the school? Lately I've gotten into reading a lot, so I'd like to check it out. Misha gives the kind of frown that makes it clear she doesn't consider reading a healthy hobby, but then picks up her smile again. There is! It's in the second floor. We can show it to you sometime. Thanks, I say. I return to my food while the girls talk between themselves. Misha and Shizune sign back and forth, very animatedly, throwing sideways glances at me, but Misha refrains from translating. Maybe they're talking about secret girl stuff or something. Returning to class after lunch, we find the shy girl who is back in the class covering her face was still sitting in the classroom. She jumps when we come in and seems to shrink down in her seat as if trying to hide. Um, Misha and Shizune, in fact all the students as they come into class, totally ignore her and act as if she's not there. Once class is over, we make our way over to the auxiliary building where we meet the nurse. Uh, he is a friendly, if very strange, individual who uh, looks at our chart, talks about our condition, and most importantly tells us that he believes we need to engage in exercise in order to um, improve our heart's condition, but that we must be sure not to overexert ourselves. After a pretty thorough going over, uh, he dismisses us and we leave to go back out and decide to head to the dorms. They are found across a garden, a park-like garden uh, situated in the middle of campus, a um, boys' dorm and a girls' dorm, separated from the main administration buildings and classrooms and all. Uh, traveling across this little park-like area, we enter the building and we find our room. We discover that there are only two students on the hallway, ourself and our well, hallmate across the way who's named Kinji. We have a brief introduction to him and find out that he is not only extremely um, short-sighted with very thick glasses, uh, but that he is also very, very paranoid. Uh, and in fact warns us that he saw people coming in and, and going out of our apartment earlier and that we should be very careful. Those people were, of course, our parents who have unpacked us and filled up our closet with our uniforms and everything else. A very kind thing of them to do, however, that has also left us with pretty much nothing to do for the rest of the day, as unpacking would have been at least something to fill up an hour or so. So we think about tomorrow we will definitely have to go to the library and see if we can get us a book or so to read, since that's a hobby we picked up while we were in the hospital. Our attention turns over to our nearby bed stand, where our gaze falls on all the bottles of medications that we are going to take every morning and every evening in order to keep our heart from getting worse and to keep us alive while we are here at Yamaku. On our second day we get up and we go to class, we get into a long discussion with Shichan and Misha about uh, the various clubs that are available here at the school since we need something to do during our free time. During that conversation we notice that the girl with the long dark hair who we had noticed earlier gets up and slips quietly out of the room without anyone noticing her. The teacher seems to watch her walk out but he never says a word which deeply confuses us. We also find during the conversation we are introduced to Shizune's competitive nature where she considers everything to be a contest, even doing work assignments in the class, and that even if there's no reward that she considers to do better than she has done before to be its own reward in its own contest. We discover this may be a problem as the two of them have decided that they want to try and recruit us into the student council. Um, with 
Shizune's competitive nature, it is quite likely that she is not going to accept failure in this very well and will continue pressing us to do so. Uh, finally, during this conversation, we tell them that we will go and agree to play Risk with them after class in the student council room. Suddenly, Shizune burst into a flurry of gestures. Misha looks daunted by the pace of her heated signing. Ah, uh, wait, please slow down, Shichan. Um, Hichan, Shichan says you're going to lose. I say, tell her I will crush her world empire with my rebellion. Uh, okay. Those eyes of her shine with childlike mischief. Shizune signs. She says you have no choice if you keep playing like this. No, you won't. Last time we attacked. This time, let's try and play defensive. It's likely that she's just trying to psych me out. Looking at the board again, I have a pretty good defense set up, and I'm not going to wreck it doing something reckless. A few turns later, I lose the game anyway. Shizune adjusts her glasses victoriously and allows herself to tentatively pump a fist in the air in celebration. She begins signing. Wah! <laughs> Hichan, you lost when you allowed me to take North America. I mean, Shichan, not me. Shizune signs. Getting control of North America is ambitious because it provides a five army bonus, but you can attack it from three fronts, so you must defend them all. She continues. I thought you'd have more guts. How disappointing. Ambition, Hichan. Your play needs to be more daring. Ambition, ambition. She continues. I was really excited when you took South America, but then you switched to playing defensively just because you gained a small advantage. That's no good, Hichan. You didn't take enough risks, and when you did, you didn't follow through. That's terrible, Hichan. Damn, what's it to her if I played too carefully? There's no need to rub it in my face. She continues signing. I wonder if you'd even be good for the student council. What's this, reverse psychology? I guess I don't have to worry about joining or not in that case, I tell them. She continues signing. Giving up just like that? I expected more of you. Seriously, is Shizune trying to taunt me into joining the council? Besides, I don't even want to join. It's only my second day. I can't make that kind of commitment. I haven't even taken a look at any of the other clubs yet, and these two, they're a little weird. Fine, I say. I'll consider joining the council, but I want to look at the other clubs before I decide. Really, Hichan? You're not just saying that to make us feel better. Yeah, yeah, I'm just not sure that I want to. Aww. Okay, Hichan, but we're not going to give up so easily. You said maybe. There's still a chance you'll come around. So excusing ourselves from the risk game, we head out to try and find the library, intending on checking out some books. Um, we know it's on the second floor, but we get good and lost and really can't find which one it is. So we push open one of the empty rooms and are greeted by quite a surprise. Within the room is a beautiful, tall, blonde-haired girl who we find out in the course of meeting her also happens to be blind. She is extremely polite and extremely friendly, and she invites us to tea in the room, making the tea up with very careful, determined movements. We sit and we have a nice long chat with her until the sun begins to set at which point we realize how late it's getting and that we still need to get to the library. Lily says that she will guide us there since uh, she also needs to talk to the librarian about some books that she's ordered and that she can introduce us. So she leads us down the hall to the correct room where she introduces us to Yuko, the very nervous and anxiety-ridden librarian. Uh, while the two of them sit and discuss the order of Braille books that Lily had uh, placed, we set off down the various aisles looking for books that might interest us 
um, and serve to do some reading in our evenings here at the school. I reach the end of the aisle and find a collection of desks set up for study or personal reading. Going a little further, though, I discover a nice quiet corner at the back. While the rest of the library has the odd student sitting at a desk, either reading or stealthily sleeping, the back is pretty much deserted. As I glance around, I see someone whom I recognize sitting on one of the several beanbags. It's the dark-haired girl from my class, the one who snuck out of the classroom earlier. She's reading a book, keeping it close to her face, which makes her look like she's really into it. From the way she was acting today, I had her pegged as more of a delinquent than a bookworm. In fact, her mysterious disappearance from the class raises all sorts of whys in my head. Intrigue floats slowly but surely toward the surface, and before I know it, I'm walking toward the mysterious long-haired girl. I guess there's no harm in introducing myself as I would with anyone else. She's a classmate, after all. Walking over to another beanbag, I take a seat and lay my books beside it. The girl starts, looking scaredly up at me from underneath her fringe. This is the first time I've seen her this close. Underneath her long, dense bangs, I can see that part of her face, at least a third if not half, is pretty badly scarred. My eyes are immediately drawn to the scars, subconsciously peeking past her hair until they meet her own eyes. For a second, I'm shocked and divert my eyes to the book in her hands, before I realize that looking away probably only makes it worse. It takes too many seconds to collect myself and remember what I walked up to her for. Sorry, I say, I, I didn't mean to startle you. It, it's okay, she says. The girl certainly doesn't look like it's okay, but I let it slide. So, um... Do you mind if I sit here, I ask. She seems to be very uncertain whether it's okay or not for me to sit, but finally she nods just a little. Uh, okay. I take the seat next to her and she hides herself behind her book. Life of Pi. Never heard of it. So, uh, sorry again for startling you. I'm his sow. She looks up from her book, stalling a little before replying. I... I know. We're... are in the same... same class, she says. Her speech is stilted and so quiet that it's barely audible, even in the still library. Somehow I think that my delinquent impression of her was wrong. <sighs> Hanako. I'm... Hanako she says. I resist the urge to say, that's a nice name, just to have something to say, but really, it's the only thing that I can think of. I feel like an idiot. Everyone here must be used to being different to each other, and here I am being all bothered and fussed about that kind of thing. Don't let me interrupt your reading, I say. I'll just check these books if you don't mind. She nods a little and sighs a little sigh of relief. So I try to read the covers and the introductions of the books I picked up, and she buries her face in her book. Uncomfortable silence consumes us. My eyes still wander to her direction, and I sneak peeks at her flowing hair and the scars it's hiding. After a while, I realize that she's doing the same and only pretending to be immersed in life of pie. Her gaze is not inquisitive at all, though. It darts around like a scared rabbit. When our gazes finally meet, the chain reaction is unstoppable. She stands up forcibly from the beanbag and takes a deep breath. I... I... I, I ask? I've got to go do something. Without warning, Hanako takes off and runs toward the counter. Her hair-like takeoff catches me so off guard that I don't manage to go after her until she has a good head start. By the time I reach the counter, she's nowhere to be seen. 
Lily and Yuko are happily chatting away. Knowing that I won't be able to catch Hanako myself, I approach the girls. Hey, I say, did you see, uh, notice a girl run past here? Um, uh, maybe, Yuko says. What did she look like? Uh, long dark hair, kind of shy. She had, well, some scars on her face. Lily says, you wouldn't be talking about Hanako, would you? Yeah, that's her. I saw her reading and tried to talk to her, but I think I scared her off or something. Oh dear, Lily continues. Yuko, would you excuse me? I had better try and find her. Sh sure, I'll just hold on to these until you come back. Um, what's going on, I ask. I'm sorry, but I'll have to explain it to you some other time, Lily says. Right, I'll uh, see you later then. Lily hastily grabs her cane and hurries out of the library, leaving me alone with Yuko. I don't think I'll ever get the hang of this place, I tell her. Did I do something wrong? What did you do, she asks. Nothing. I was just looking for some books, and then she got this fit and ran off. The most offending thing I can think of was that I might have looked in her general direction a few times. Well, she is a very timid girl, Yuko says. You have to be very careful around her. She can be very jumpy, I think, and she's not accustomed to talking with other people. Isn't that a bit... strange, I ask? I wonder. It's just how she is, I think. Yuko doesn't sound all that convincing. Then again, maybe this is just the norm around here. Everyone has their own problems, or else they wouldn't be here. But how should I deal with these people, I ask. Forcing myself to act overly casual only makes me feel phony. Like I was supposed to be ignoring the elephant in the room. Yuko fidgets, looking like she wants to say something to that, but resists it. I think it's only an elephant, only if you feel that way, she says. I guess she doesn't have a good sense of self-restraint. It makes me smile, and she blushes heavily. What, did I say something stupid? No, no, I say, it sounded really wise. I guess you're right, it's more about me than anyone else. Neither of us has anything to add, so Yuko fills the silence by shuffling some papers around. And we have been able to condense almost the first six episodes here. Episodes zero through about two-thirds of the way through episode five into this episode. Um, <clears throat> as we go along, we've had a few uh, uh, important decisions here, of course. Uh, the first one here, where we introduce ourselves to the class or not, was the very first decision that comes up. Uh we chose this time not to introduce ourselves to the class. According to the flow sheet that I have that I've been following, this actually does not give us points with anyone. If we did like we did last time and introduced ourselves, it gives us points with Shizune and Misha because, you know, she likes our bold attitude and that gathers her attention. Now, while the, like I said, the flu sheet and all says that it doesn't give any points with the Hanako and Lily, I do seem to notice, I swear that the initial conversation with, with Hanako in the library is a little bit differently, that she doesn't, uh, I swear last time she sat there when we said, is it okay if I sit here, um, she, we got some different dialogue there where uh, it, she had to think about it the first time, you know, with us having introduced ourselves, And this time she was just like, I think we just actually just went in and sat down and then apologized, if I remember right. So it did seem to change the dialogue a bit, even if it didn't actually give us any points down her path. Our first actual points with Lily and Hanako come here in the cafeteria, where we asked last time, we told them we thought we had everything they needed to know, and we got points with Shizune and Misha because they figured that that meant they were very good guides and had done a great job in, in instructing us. This time we ask about the library. And with Lily and Hanako both being bookworms, 
that uh, allowed them to tell us uh, where the library is and what hours it, it is open and enabled us to get our first points with Hanako and Lily. Similarly, uh, during the Risk game, last time we attacked and acted aggressively, and once again, this endeared us to Shizune. She likes a fighter. She likes someone who's got a competitive nature. So this, that gave us points with Shizune last time. This time around, we played defensively, and we lost, and we disappointed her. You know, she's got her doubts now, or she doesn't like the turtle. Uh, so we didn't actually get any points with anyone by choosing defensively. It doesn't give you any points down anyone's path, but it prevents you from joining points with the student council here. So then we have our first conversation with Hanako in the library. Once again, we did the same thing we did before, which was apologize for startling her when we sat down. Once again, if you choose to introduce yourself, you actually don't score points with anyone. By apologizing to her, you kind of get her interest that, hey, maybe this guy, you know, you're sitting there apologizing, you're, you're saying you're sorry for interrupting, you don't want to interrupt her and all, so maybe he's okay, maybe he's, you know, got a nicer nature to him than, you know, than would first might appear. However, being Hanako and being you know, a brand new face, it doesn't take long before her anxieties take over and uh, she does run and flee from you. So there we are. We're coming along nicely along the common path here in this condensed form. As I said before, if you want to see the, the full-on uh, dialogues and everything, you can always go back and read them along the Emmy path. Uh, we should be pretty soon finishing up. I anticipate one more of these prologue episodes, and then we will be pretty well established down the branch of Hanako and Lily. We won't have actually entered one of their branches yet, but we will be on their path. Just like I said before, when we do the exercise thing, we go down the path of, of Rin, I mean, I'm sorry, of Emi and Shizune, we should soon start down the branch that leads to Hanako and Lily. So we will see you in part two.